Welcome to Food Travel Talk TV, a monthly talk show brought to you by the World Food Travel Association, the world's leading authority on food and beverage tourism. Food Travel Talk TV was created by and for the world's culinary travel trade. Our goal with the show is to inspire us all with ways to help us do business better. Every month, we invite industry thought leaders, opinion makers, and trendsetters to discuss important topics for our industry's benefit. My name is Eric Wolf, and I'll be your host today for our May 2021 episode number 13. This month's topic is planning recovery for the tourist guide industry. And I'd like to introduce our guest, Alushka Ritchie, who is president of the World Federation of Tourist Guide Associations. Hi, Eric. Greetings from Cape Town, and thank you for including us tonight. Feel free to post your questions at any time in the Q&A window, and we will reserve the last 20 minutes or so to answer your questions. Now I'd like to set the tone for today's episode. What can the tourist guide industry expect in the next year? Well, vaccines are getting rolled out around the world. In many countries like the US and UK, the infection rates are starting to come down, while in other countries like India, the rates are soaring. Tourism is on the verge of recovery in some places, and it will restart first in regions and countries where the perception is that it is safe to travel once again. Vaccine passports are also a topic of discussion, but they are not without controversy. There are a lot of moving parts when it comes to restarting tourism, but one important piece of the equation is the role of tourist guides who are eager to start work again. Some reports indicate that people will be traveling in smaller and private groups ostensibly to reduce risk. This is the perfect target for tourist guides. For the next hour or so, we'll talk about how we think the industry will restart and what tourist guides can do to be ready for and to profit from the restart of tourism. So welcome, Alushka. Thank you, Eric. I look forward to this chat today. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to be chatting with you today. We don't get a, a chance to talk that much in person, and we've been strategic partners now for a couple of years or two organizations. And I think it is um, time for, for the rest of the world to hear about the WFTGA, what you guys do, how many guide associations around the world you represent, and, and where your, your chapters are located. Thank you, Eric. So yes, um, World Federation, we're an international association. And we have full members, individual members, and affiliate members. And although I'm based in Cape Town, South Africa, the organization is actually based in Vienna, Austria. So at the moment, we have approximately 90 countries with members, um, our members in them. And our main aim is to promote the profession of the tourist guide. So we really do try and advocate for the professional tourist guiding sector. We have adopted the European standards and this actually defines the tourist guide, tourist guide. So the definition speaks to performance and the requirements of the tourist guide. So as you can imagine, um, legislation being different for qualified and certified tourist guides differs from country to country. So this really does create a, quite a bit of a challenge. And then we engage with our members through our international convention and then also here, which is dedicated to us, the Professional Tourist Guide, and that is International Tourist Guide Day. And this is typically celebrated on the 21st of January. So this is a really nice uh, day where we kind of send out a unified message and we use our local press and we host members of the public and really sort of promote the tourist guide and the tourist guiding profession. Fantastic. 90 countries. That's that's fantastic. Is there a continent that you're stronger on, would you say? Um, European, Europe, Europe for sure. Um, and then we've really put a strong focus on Africa um, and growing our Africa membership as well um, on an individual membership basis because associations don't always exist. And then we try and get the individual tourist guide involved and help them to grow and sort of meet and become an association as well. Okay, interesting. And is there a continent or a region of the world where you'd like to grow and be stronger? Africa and South America, absolutely. Um, you know, there's, there's so much potential there. And we, we have had those countries bid before. We've had kind of cities in Asia bid to host our convention. So in the future, who knows, we might find a convention around the corner on your doorstep and hopefully we'll get some local tourist guides to attend. Well, we may be able to help you with Latin America. We have some pretty good connections there. So we'll talk after the show Fantastic. about that. Fantastic. 
collaboration is key. <laughs> yeah, it is key. I saw that in an email today, the title message. So guides everywhere have been affected by the pandemic, but have guides in some countries fared better than others? This is a little of a tough one to answer. It's, it's sort of all relative and speaks to numerous things. Um, it's interesting because some countries actually celebrate tourism and they really do acknowledge it as an economic driver. And they have those tourism structures in place in their governments and so forth. But there's also countries that actually don't have a tourism portfolio or a government official that does not represent tourism. So, so that is also a struggle for some of the, the guides. And then this then adds to it, is it a legislated and acknowledged profession or is it still a profession that's trying to get that acknowledgement from governments? So yes, some have, moved, some have kind of um, fared better than others in a sense of they've received financial support from their governments where others have not. And some have actually moved forward out of their own initiatives. So um, they've become innovative in doing this and they've really sort of continued to to grow on the, pro the protocols in the respective cities and gone with private sector rather than waiting for government. Could you give a couple examples, maybe of places where this has worked a little easier for guides because of those things that you've mentioned? So from a financial support point of view, um, the guides in the USA have received a little bit of financial uh, support. We've had some of the tourist guides in South Africa as well receive some financial support. And then we've seen, for example, the Philippines and the Slovenian guides who have really grown their own initiatives and move forward on getting that acknowledgement for the tourist guiding profession. Mm, okay. So do you predict that uh, the demand for tourist guides is gonna be greater in some countries than others? when things start think, to kick off? Yeah, I, th I think absolutely. Um, there will be certain countries that will grow uh, faster with the tourism and with tourists and others, but this is also very closely linked to the vaccinations. So in, in the countries where we've seen the vac vaccination processes move forward quicker, we've actually seen that um, the tour operators and others in the value chain of tourism are asking that the tourist guides be vaccinated and the uh, uh, hospitality sector be vaccinated because they want the vaccinated tourists to only communicate with those who have already been vaccinated. So in the countries where this process is moving forward quite quickly, we see that those tour tourists and travel will resume a lot quicker. Whereas in the countries where those in, you know, tourist guides and those in the employed in that value chain won't necessarily see that quite yet because the tour operators are skeptic to work with mm. unvaccinated people at this stage. So it's a little bit of a, a, a you know, it's unknown at this point in time, but, but that is what we're seeing right now. Um, in a few months, that could be completely different. That could really affect how people how quickly people restart work because if vaccines aren't available or if you have personal reasons not to get a vaccine, maybe maybe you're pregnant or maybe you have another health condition or maybe maybe you've already had COVID and, and there's all this, you know, if you've had COVID, should you still get the vaccine? And, and sometimes people are having worse reactions to the vaccines if they've already had COVID. And if, if it's the price to, to play is that you have to be vaccinated, um, that, wow, that could really put a wrench in things, couldn't it? Absolutely. And we've seen that airlines are, are kind of setting the trend on this demand and asking for these vaccination certificates and asking for these passports. So tourism in general is following their lead to a certain extent. And I think there's a much broader conversation around that side. And we are by no means health professionals. Um, but, but yes, it is definitely a trend when it comes to the employers of tourist guides. This is going to become very complicated because some areas like the EU are, are very much in favor of a vaccine, quote unquote, passport. But other places like in the United States, there are actually legislation going into place that they have, have um, ruled that vaccine passports are um, against the law. They're illegal. You can't do them. So how do you weigh that? That's something that each country and each government will, will have to see for themselves. And, and as tourist guides in our separate cities and, and countries, we need to adhere to what our government dictates. So at the end of the day, we just need to research as individuals and as a sector what applies to us. Yeah. 
Wow, that's that's really going to be complicated. I I don't know. I if you if you're looking at the countries and and how quickly the vaccines are getting rolled out, it, it sounds like 2021 is probably going to still be a difficult year. It it depends, and there's and there's different scenarios at play. We've got our domestic tourism as well that we can work with as tourist guides. Um, there's other opportunities that present as employment for tourist guides. But yes, it, it's definitely by no means a, a short-term thing that we are working, working mm. against at the moment. So I live in Spain, which is a, a big country for tourism, as you know. And the last statistics I saw were that only 5 million people in the country had been vaccinated. And in a country with, with a lot more people than that, I mean, are those 5 million people are the first ones, the guides, the tourist guides? I mean, the hospitality workers? Again, completely depends on the government. Different governments have prioritized different things. So for example, in South Africa, there is a push asking government to please put the frontline workers from the taxi drivers through to the receptionist at the hotel, through to the tourist guides, everyone working with the tourism sector to put them as a priority after healthcare workers, of course, so that we can get the economy going again. So again, it depends on governments who acknowledge tourism as an economic driver. Um, and in the countries where they don't do that, they don't see those working in tourism as the ones in need of being a potential first in line. Mm. Um, so again, from government to government, it really is a process. And again, that's where the lobbying comes in. So where your tourist guide associations are collaborating with your tourism sectors, private sectors, um, to actually push with your governments for that acknowledgement and, and for that process to take place. And I know that many guides are licensed in more than one country. So could you imagine that it's quite clear in country A, but country B, it's not so clear, or parts of country C, you can guide in and not, I mean, it's, this is a can of worms. It becomes completely complicated because then you have cruise tourism, for example, who is starting to get mobilized. And what happens with cruisers when they dock, they use excursions. And again, they're using tourist guides in different countries every second day, a different country, a different docking. So then you have the complicated system of where are you docking, you know, have those tourist guides been vaccinated if all your guests are vaccinated. So completely complicated cross-border challenge. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, wow, there's no easy answer on this. Well, yeah. let's talk about then the, the current situation as well as the past year. Have guides been able to find much business selling their services to locals? Has there been demand for that? So keeping in mind traditionally and pre-COVID, um, domestic tourism and the locals have never really been um, great um, users of tourist guides for various reasons and and something that we're doing is promoting the profession of tourist guide is telling your domestic market listen use a tourist guide um, they really can give you access to those stories and those hidden hidden gems that you never would usually have access to even being part of your domestic market and your domestic tourism um, and then we have some of our members who've really used that domestic market as a potential source of income um, by, so, by selling their services in advance as gifts and in the form of gift certificates for use in the future for, for family members to give to other family members and go on tour in their own city. And then we also have our guides who have volunteered their services. So haven't necessarily made a business from selling their services to the domestic market, but using that in anticipation of maybe doing some marketing for themselves, creating awareness for the profession, um, working with schools and students or looking forward into the future um, at, you know, doing that again and then possibly being paid and earning an income from it. Mm -hmm. Those are all good ideas. Have you heard many stories of your tourist guide members doing virtual tours? And, and where I'm going with this is because I think that one of the things we've uncovered uh, that has happened since this is all um happened with the pandemic is that all of a sudden disabled travelers, whether they're physically challenged or um, emotionally or mentally challenged, all of a sudden they now have access to tours that they wouldn't have had access to before for whatever reason. Maybe they have um, autism and, and being in crowds is, is too overwhelming for the senses, or maybe they, they're in a wheelchair and they just simply can't do some tours that require steps or other, other situations. So have your tourist guides tried to, to meet that demand and do some more virtual tours now? Definitely. 
prior to the pandemic, virtual tours were already in, in existence. Um, but what it did do, the pandemic did create a more competitive environment. Mm -hmm. And with this came the, with that competitiveness came the fact that suddenly the tourist guides couldn't just do a virtual tour. They had to elevate their virtual skills and then produce a product that was worthy of the viewers. So when it came to viewership, finding that unique selling point, and it speaks exactly to what you were saying, catering to different markets, not your usual viewer that used to view the, the virtual tour and attend the virtual tour. Now there's so many ages, there's, so, there's demographics, there's, there's so many things involved with those who you sell your product to and who've used your product. So it really did create um, an environment of, of we wanted to be flexible and suddenly you had to sort of learn all these new skills and identify which platform was suitable to you because again, multiple platforms. And again, is it something you want to use as income generating? Or is it a, something you want to use to sort of use as a marketing tool? So almost give the viewer a taster and saying, come and visit to if that was your viewership. So virtual tour is again a huge conversation, but it did, did give the tourist guide an opportunity to grow, to learn new skills um, and, to, and to use virtual tours, as I say, as an opportunity and not a threat. Um, and this was a fantastic way for us um, as an industry not to lose our knowledge or our skills either. Although we had to adapt how we do things, you know, it really was an opportunity to continue doing things. Yeah, indeed. Well, I think um, we're 20 minutes into the show. I think uh, we are at our, our peak numbers now. And I would like to know how many people attending right now are actually licensed tourist guides. Would you like to know? Of course, it would be very interesting <laughs> to know. All right, so we're going to launch a quick poll and give you all a minute to, to answer this. So are you a licensed tourist guide as your primary profession? So let's see what, a lot of participation. You guys are fast. It's great to see. So we have currently 36 attendees in the room and 27 respondents so far. We'll give you another few seconds. If you're doing something in the other window, just click the yes or no button really quick. All right, I think we're, we're done. I'm gonna end polling and I'm gonna share the results. So 48% of people attending are a licensed tourist guide and 52% are not. That's good. That, that way more people get to know about the sector and what the tourist guide does. Yeah, interesting. Okay, excellent. So um, in the introduction, we were talking about how some industry leaders have hypothesized that there may actually be a higher demand for tourist guide services for private and smaller groups. What's your opinion on this? I think when it comes to the trends that we're looking at, private and smaller groups is definitely one of the trends. Um, with this in mind, it does create opportunities and also challenges for the tourist guide. Um, the private and smaller groups as a trend, we've been told that they will have slightly more expectations as tourists and they will be slightly more demanding. But this is fine, tourist guides can cope with anything. We are uniquely placed to facilitate the connection between experiences and what the tourist wants. So with these smaller groups and with these, let's say the trend of private groups, they are also coming with an expectation of wanting to contribute to communities, wanting to contribute to sustainability, and also ethical, wanting ethical and authentic experiences when on tour. So keep in mind this year off, we say off from tourism has also made the tourists stronger in their knowledge and wiser in what they want. So with these new private tours, we as tourist guides now are having to work a little harder in meeting the expectation of sustainability and contribution to, to communities and authenticity. So this is so nice for culinary tourist guides because using food as a way to do this is also a really good experience. 
And as tourist guides, we want any opportunity to tell stories. And obviously private and smaller groups allow us to tell stories better and tell stories in a way that speaks to who we are hosting as guests versus a coach full of tourists. So I'm excited that this is a, a trend. I'm excited for the tourist guides. Um, it's an opportunity for the tourist guides to show off, um, which is also much nicer to do with private and smaller groups as well. Indeed, yeah, it's uh, you can get so much more done with four or six or eight people than 56. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And as a culinary tourist guide, um, it's also nicer to take this kind of group and make the experience really special. Mm, very much so. Will this mean that the, the cost of those tours will increase? Definitely. Um, in cases where it requires the necessary transport and all of that, uh, smaller tours have always been known to be slightly more costly. Um, but again, when things reactivate in tourism, um, there will be a lot of competitiveness, which gives you the edge to be competitive and source the right service providers. And this will also speak to you managing your costs as for it on a tour as well. Do you have any idea or have you seen anything about how much on average the prices are increasing because of the changes? Completely, completely varies. Um, again, depends on the size of vehicle, depends on the distance traveled. You know, if we really want to give them that authentic experience and tour, we need to take them out of the city center and go visit those local communities. So you're also talking time is money um, as well. So our, our tourists are getting savvy and they're getting wise and they're telling us what they want. And, and if they want, want specific things, they also need to be aware that some of those things come at a cost. So it's not just that guides are doing the same tour they've always done, but instead of 16 people, it's four. It's that tours are being rewritten. Absolutely. You cannot go into the new uh, opening of tourism with the mindset of I will still do things the way I used to do them in the same manner and the same itinerary. We, have had, we really have to adapt and be flexible and we have to change what, how we used to do things and, and really grow on it and, and add to it and make it more unique and special. Um, keeping in mind that tourists have really been spoiled in the way of ac accessing all this virtual content. Um, that is their expectation and that's what they're, they're coming with now. So related to that, so the guides have had to change and they've had to change the products they offer. Are booking systems um, keeping up with these changes too? For example, can someone book a tour or a tourist guide and have some kind of verification, you know, the guide has been vaccinated or this is an updated tour or health and safety protocols are in place? Are, are you seeing changes in the booking systems as well? Yeah. Absolutely. So in their environment as well, it's also become quite competitive. There's a lot of new technology on the market and there's a lot of options for a tourist guide to go and load their tour and load their services and load themselves as a tourist guide on offer. So again, it speaks to how quick these platforms are in adding that kind of access for a, for a guest or for a tourist um, to their platforms. So at the moment, vaccinations are not part of any platform I, uh, I am aware of. Um, so far, I've only come across it with tour operators asking for that information. Um, but I think the platforms will surely follow, follow suit soon if that is going to continue as being a criteria. Yeah, I think at least for the short term, probably for the next couple of years, it's going to be something consumers are going to demand, you know, has, has this guide been vaccinated or, or I don't know, it's, um, you know, is alcohol gel available? <laughs> Things like that. So you were talking a little bit about sustainability and how guides have had to change. And I think one thing that we've noticed that's happened in parallel with the pandemic, and it's not just the, um, the uh, health and safety stuff, but it, it's the how we treat each other, how we treat coworkers, how we treat um, people from different backgrounds. There's the, the all the situations that we've heard around the world about uh, racial inequality, gender inequality, and pay um, th things like this. And sustainability. When we look at sustainability here at the association, we look at um, we look at the of course the environmental aspect, but we look at the socio cultural as well as the economic. So other people call that people planet profit, but we like to be a little more specific. So have guides had to learn more about things like recycling and wages that the, the 
tour stops are paying the people? I mean, how, how much detail are, are guides having to learn now to keep up with these changes? So let's take a step back. So what, what the pandemic did do was create tourist guides to become health and safety ambassadors. So we've in, evolved in that role and we've seen that now we are the messages of those protocols in certain countries um, and in, in certain cities. So with that comes the training. So for example, in South Africa, there's been tourist guide COVID training in other countries as well. And that training then gives you that insight of what you need to do within reasonable um, expectations, of course, as a tourist guide with your guests. What we've also seen, for example, is the Department of Culture and Tourism in Abu Dhabi, they've just released a, a COVID-19 40 point safety protocol list for their tour operators and tourist guides. So again, they have given their, their tourism sector directive. But when it comes to sustainability, some of those points do speak to it. Um, and keeping in mind sustainability, as you said, comes from various different sources and the way you address it is, is, is different. So as a tourist guide, um, in our training, if you're a proper tourist guide and a professional tourist guide and you've done the relevant training, what you mentioned with sustainability when it comes to how you treat people, how you deal with political questions, how you deal with the political environment, that training is actually one of the modules within your tourist guiding course. So learning how to treat those situations with um, not only compassion and empathy, but also with certain political grace from your side is something we as tourist guides learn when we do our courses. And then coming to our sustainability side of recycling and, all, and, and you know, working differently as a, as a culinary tourist guide, for example, those are things we've all had to educate ourselves on as well, either within protocols within our cities of what they're doing, or as individuals really elevating our skills during these times and educating ourselves as to how to move forward on our tours and how to address these things. Mm. So from an environmental point of view and doing culinary tourist guiding, you would then make sure that you are using um, your sources of your, of your tour um, as, and the places you go to would be, you know, really having their own initiatives in place. And this is what you showcase to your guests. Um, also, how you package your, your food during that day of, of, your, of your tour is also important. You know, are you using sustainable products? So it really is a broad question and a, and a, and a broad way of, of um, accessing the, you know, what we should and shouldn't be doing. Interesting. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seems to me that whereas health and safety protocols have affected all types of tour guiding, whether it's history, architecture, um, you know, museums, whatever it is, but when it comes to food and drink specifically, I think that, like you said, the politics comes into it more. So are, the, are these things fair trade that you're serving me? Is the, the packaging that you're giving me sustainable? You know, is it made of corn plastic or is it biodegradable? Uh, all of those, it, it, food just brings up many more questions, I think, that, you know, the, the building that's been there for 100 or 500 or 1,000 years is, is going to be the same building. It's just now we're wearing masks or using hand gel, but, but now all of a sudden we're looking at this food and saying, well, you know what, actually, we're all vegan. Or do you recycle those tasting spoons made of plastic? Yeah, yeah. And I think now even more so with the expectation of the, of the visitors and the clients being, they want that farm to table experience, for example. So everyone involved in that value chain of farm to table, do they speak to sustainability? Um, so this is where our research comes in as tourist guides. Are we using the right service providers in that value chain? And this actually re reminds me, the UNWTO are currently running um, an academic panel, panel session which focuses on gastronomy in Africa. And they've interviewed yeah. some wonderful chefs, right, yeah. interviewed some, some lovely uh, properties, and all of them really do showcase how they are being sustainable. So please, anyone who's interested, uh, listen to those. You, you can learn a lot. But... And also you can gain, not only gain insight, but as a tourist guide, really identify opportunities as well. So I found those sessions really useful because although some of those, those ideas, you, you kind of think, oh, well, I already know that. It's always good just to do a little refresher as well. Mm. Yeah, I did hear about those. Um, and how do we learn more about those? Is it just on the UNWTO website or? Correct. You can just Google UNWTO Academy and those sessions will come up. Okay. Fantastic. Um, now, 
we know that the guides have had to, we've talked a little bit how they've diversified um, their activities. Do you think that those changes, whether they're virtual tours or giving cooking classes or, or even like some tour operators are doing with the destination food boxes, do you think these changes will be permanent that the guides have had to permanently alter their product portfolios or do you think things will kind of turn back to more of a traditional way of, of simply guiding? This is my personal insight and my personal feeling. I think this is here to stay. I think at, at first, diversification was a way of survival for many, but because of the expectation of the tourists, when they start experiencing these different ways we've implemented diversification, I think it will be something that will be expected in the future. So to do away with it might be you know, negligent on our behalf as tourist guides. So I think it's something that's here to, that's here to stay for sure. Mm, okay. Um, I think it might be time for another question. What do you think? Yes, let's find out from a poll um, what our tourist guides are currently adhering to when it comes to their guiding. And um, yeah, are they, do they have protocols in place? So we've just launched the polling and the question is, if you are a licensed culinary tourist guide, so specifically a culinary tourist guide, are you ready to guide with the new health and safety protocols or are you still waiting for guidance from your area government or professional organizations? So please give us your thoughts on this. This will help us to get a temperature check on where things are around the world. And I'm really pleased with the geographic turnout we've got today. We, I think we've got every continent represented. Absolutely, we're being very global today. Okay, we've only had nine respondents and there are 33 of you in the room. So some more participation, please. <laughs> So it's trending that about two thirds of people are ready for the new normal and one third are still waiting for guidance. Mm -hmm. people and I will, I will touch on the waiting for guidance if you don't mind, Eric, when we're done. So, sorry, is that again, Alushka? I would like to touch on the waiting for guidance yeah. once oh. the poll is done. I'd of like course. to comment on that. So someone mentioned that not everyone is a culinary guy, which could explain the lower participation mm -hmm. in this poll. Okay, so fair enough. So I'm going to end the polling here and share results with everyone. So 62% of respondents, so we had 11, no, 13 total respondents out of the 33 here, uh, 62 or eight people said they're all ready. Culinary tourist guides all ready to go. Five or 38% said, nope, still waiting for guidance. What do you think about that, Alushka? Yeah, I'm not too surprised to hear that. I think the waiting for guidance comes from, as I mentioned earlier, the government's not being too truly supportive of the tourism sectors. Um, and this is what I really want to say. We've seen some of our members succeed in just in the tourist guiding sector in having those protocols and really pushing health and safety. Um, and this comes through working with your destinations. So whether it be on private sector level or civil society organizations, you really need to address that and work with those, those destination tourism authorities and all of those in your tourism value chain, your tour operator societies, they really play a huge role in how you move, move forward in the sector in your city. Um, so lobbying on your behalf through your association, and if you don't have an association, you know, just get a few, few voices together and make sure that you're heard. It's really important that this collaboration process takes place um, to, to drive your sector and to help make sure that you're part of this, this change in tourism and that you are ready. When tourism reactivates, you are ready. And don't underestimate the power of your associations. Um, they really can be representative of your needs and putting these policies in place and advancing your sector. So please go to your local association as a tourist guide and, and work with them in, in pushing this agenda. You know, you said something really profound there, be part of the change. And I think that that is, that's absolutely essential because um, some people in our industry that I've talked to have not had that orientation. They felt like I'm going to sit and wait, wait and see what happens, wait and see what to be told, 
right? What we should be doing, what the, what the guidelines are, but you've said something very different to be proactive. So contact your tourist guide association. If you don't have one, contact your tourist office. If you don't have one, maybe talk to other guides or a nearby tourist office or a guide association in a nearby country, for example, and try and get advice from them. Uh, be part of the solution, help drive Absolutely. your own future. Absolutely, work with those who employ you, the tour operators, even hotels, anyone who employs you, work with them in moving forward. Yeah, and I think this gives uh, tourist guides another way to um, stay in contact with past guests and get in touch with them and say, you know, hey, the industry is changing. We'd like to hear from you. What is important to you now? What are your concerns? What can we as guides factor into our future tours? And by the way, we'd love to see you again in, you know, Riga, Tel Aviv, San Francisco, Santa Fe, Buenos Aires, wherever it is, right? That, that's absolutely it. And with that, you will get the confidence to, or you will help them with the confidence to travel again. And that's, well, that's half the reason people don't really want to start traveling is because they don't have the confidence when they get to where they travel to that all these protocols will be in place. The tourist guides won't be ready. Yeah. Speak to them directly. Tell them we are ready. We've had our training. We, we, we have these protocols in place. We, if not, we are busy with them. Really get that confidence in them and build that up. I think that's a, that's another really important point. It is that that confidence because right now I, I haven't really done much traveling except for my move from the UK to Spain. That was who who else moves in the middle of a pandemic? I know it's crazy. I knew you. I only I know, but um, I think that there's that mental block there about about should I travel? And at the end of this month, we have our Food Truck Spain event and I will be physically going to that. And I'm actually looking forward because I want to see what's in process, what's, what um, checks and balances are in place, what processes are in place. And as part of Food Truck Spain, they also do tours and I'd like to see what has been done for that? So meet the local tourist guide and see how they're see how things have changed really. And and I think that to, as tourist guides, um, let's let's be positive about this. Reach out to your past customers and let them know that you're planning. You're making plans already. You're you're you know change is in the air. You're working on it and you'd love their feedback. And I think that that starts to plant the seed. Then oh yeah, we're going to start traveling again soon. Absolutely. That communication is so important. And also, you know, prepare them, prepare them and say, look, when you meet me, I will have a mask on, we'll be using an audio system, um, where, whereas I won't be speaking directly. But, you know, please be prepared that these are the changes. And if they aren't prepared before they get to, to you and to see you, it will also help with the transition in the new way of touring. So that communication is really crucial. Prepare them for the changes. But reinforce the fact that it's still you it's still authentic it's still these wonderful stories but just told in a slightly different way yeah yeah and i guess well if if the trend is smaller in private groups but i mean there's still going to be transportation it may not be the the 27 passenger buses it might be the the 12 person minivan Yep, the coaches are still in play, um, but with the protocols in place. So every second seat has a cross on, you okay. know, you can't sit directly. As a tourist guide, there's a special way you use your microphone now with, oh. with regards to um, health, health and safety as well. Um, bring your own if you use the coaches, you know, you must use a special covering, how to do, to do the, the antibacterials in the coach. Um, clearing the air conditioning filter of the coach. So there's a lot of little things that we now have to add to our checklist as tourist guides pre-tour and post-tour. Well, cleaning the air con filters on the coach may not be a bad thing. I'm not sure how much that was done in the past. So that would be welcome. But I'm curious, uh, how, what, how has it changed the way you hold your microphone now? So not necessarily holding it, but how you use. So if you do not have your own and you use one that's in place, um, you actually cover it with a bag now, or you take a foam sponge that you replace. Um, so you bring your own foam, replace what's there, and then every day you use a different one. Oh. Um, it's the same as when, you, when you're changing groups on your coach, you have to re-clean re the entire coach if it's a morning tour, an afternoon tour, um, and how you dispose of things on the coach, how you dispose of the wipes, how you dispose of the masks, all those little factors come into oh. play as well. 
someone and also just... when you speak on the mic sorry you project so there's a special way that you know that you have to wear multiple masks and not project not project wow that that would be challenging i think absolutely the the challenges we now you know we always have to think of the safety of our of our of our people on tour so that's that comes with the, with the nature of the job but now they are added things so you cannot touch the luggage um until you've done you know the way you touch the luggage is different have you coordinated with the driver has the luggage been sprayed don't let the guests grab the luggage until the, the handles have been cleaned um when you arrive at the airport when you disembark, how you handle the luggage, how you people touch people, so a lot of little things added yeah. to the mix. Or the the doing that instead of shaking hands now, doing the namaste. Yeah, yeah. yeah. one of the the great um, uh, things left behind from the pandemic is a new way of greeting people. Um, and then we have a comment here. Someone was saying instead of the foam, maybe use Kleenex or you know a paper tissue and a rubber band. Yes, no. Mm -hmm. That, that could work, but again, presents challenges. Kleenex filters moisture through onto the, the foam. So, you know, the, there's different versions of how long um, it, it lives on foam, steel, plastic. So, you know, research, research, research. And that's something we're good at as guides. So just really research before you do your first tour post-pandemic. Mm. Okay, well, let's uh, go ahead and open up for some questions. If anyone has any specific questions for Alushka that you'd like to ask, go ahead and put those in the Q&A channel. And also you can upvote other people's questions. So if you saw a question that you really like, you can upvote that. And while we wait for that, Eric, just to, to refer back to the Abu Dhabi's 40, 40 point COVID safety protocol list, it's really insightful and it does provide, if you're in, in a city where you're not getting the guidelines from your government and you're not getting the guidelines from your tour operator, this protocol list is really a good one to use in practice. Um, so we'll be posting those links on our Facebook page in the next few days to that um, article. So feel free to, to have a read up on that. I'm just going to Google this right now and see if I can get the the link. Um, Abu Dhabi issues 40 point protocol. Okay, all you need to know entry guidelines. Okay, I'm just going to post this news article in the chat. And then, and then maybe at, at World Fed, we've also done our protocols uh, last year, we completed our protocols from uh, for tourist guides. Um, perhaps needs updating, things are forever changing and so fast. Um, but we do have our own protocols in place as well for the tourist guiding sector. And now are those protocols just for your members? Um, we can share them widely amongst tourist guides. So we will hope to have those available soon on our website. Okay, all right. And um, I think you were just in the process of updating your website. Is that is that complete now? Or are you still couple more days um, to go. We're busy with the last few finishes. Um, we really worked a lot on behind the scenes of the website to do things that we never thought possible a few years oh. ago. Um, so it's more behind the scenes. Um, we, we're very excited about that. Not everyone will see, but as an international organization, we're very excited for that part. Um, and we hope to have everything up and running in the next few days. Well, give us a preview. I'm excited. What, what can we expect to see on your new website? Um, so it's the back end that's very nice. So the way that we message with members internally, the way we have our groupings. So for example, we have area representatives, we have global brand ambassadors, we have the executive board, and then we have our levels of membership. And it's an internal communication process behind the website that allows us to do things and, and communicate with our delegates for general assemblies. So we're really excited at the potential that that's going to give us as a um, keeping up with our members and, and, and keeping them informed and then keeping us informed. Um, you know, people get a little bit lazy on the email system. It's true. It's true. Yeah, we recently introduced a new member system and it's it's like night and day how it works now. It's so much better and people can message each other directly and search better. And it's just, it's fantastic. So I, I know 
what you, you're probably so excited you just can't wait for it to roll out <laughs> it's been it's been a long time coming yeah, <laughs> I'm ours, are very excited ours as well so we've got a couple of questions here and let's see the first one will wfta publish some precautionary measures health measures for culinary tourist guides affiliated with who maybe so um the answer is no and we're not going to issue precautionary me measures or guidelines because there are fantastic organizations like WFTGA who are already doing that. We don't want to duplicate the work that's already been done. We don't want to have another voice that's adding confusion to the mix. We want to make sure that we support our partners. So whether it is um, WFTGA or other specific guiding associations or UNTIP WTO or whoever it is, we want to support their work. We're not going to reinvent the wheel. Um, let's see, here's a comment that the American Bus Association in the USA has a great set of protocols for bus operations. So if anyone would like to check that out, it goes by ABA or American Bus Association. And then here's a comment, a recent CDC guidelines have placed less focus on sanitizing surfaces as COVID is transmitted more from airborne particles rather than contact on surfaces. Why are there still such strict guidelines on surface sanitations? Well, I'm not a health, um, health expert, but I think it also just speaks to the confidence in the consumer. I think it's a, it's a mindset. It's something that's ingrained in everyone. And I think it just has the element of a psychological uh, feeling of we are safe and we are feeling safe. Yeah. Um, that's my personal take. <laughs> I'm not a doctor by any means. Well, no, and I think people are, are going to, you know, we learned in the beginning, the very start of the pandemic that, you know, don't touch services, spray everything with alcohol. I mean, you know, even in our house, when we get packages from Amazon, we spray everything with an alcohol spray 70% mm -hmm. before, and then we wash our hands after we, you know, it's, it's quite this yeah. ordeal, you know, the, the bag goes on the kitchen floor, it's sprayed, turned, sprayed, wash your hands, bag is left, come back 10 minutes, <laughs> it's, it's this, you know, but, um, but people who are going to be on tour now, they may not know that it's, it's perhaps more airborne and that surfaces are less risky. So they're just gonna go with the information that, that has been ingrained in their heads. Well, also remember that now part of our checklist as a tourist guide is also to inform guests what will happen on tour. So mm -hmm. part of that information that we then share at the start of the tour is how are you feeling? If you feel X, Y, Z, let us know. If you are shaking hands or touching services, do this. So all of that is education to us and then education to our members or our visitors, sorry, our visitors and our tourists. So again, it's all about communication and all about education. Um, we have, for example, we have to tell the guests when you disembark, make sure that you dispose of your masks in this packet and not this packet because it's two different things. Mm -hmm. So again, it's the way we educate ourselves and prepare ourselves for what we're going to be doing on tour. Okay, good, good stuff. Uh, so someone has provided the URL for the American Bus Association. It is buses.org and that's bus with one S. So B-U-S-E-S -S dot O-R-G. Thank you for that. And here we have a question. What would be the top three challenges facing the guide industry going forward? I would say employment. Um, the, in a lot of countries, a, a tourist guide is a full time is wanting to work full time. In many countries, it's a part time position, not by choice, but because of the amount of work there is. So employment is the first and foremost. Um, even if we get tourists, are they aware of what a tourist guide offers? Are they aware of what we, you know, are you using a tourist guide? So the next thing would be acknowledgement of the tourist guiding sector to keep getting those voices heard shouting from the rooftops, making sure that everyone using, you know, everyone involved in the tourist journey is making sure there's a tourist guide as well. And that links to employment as well. Um, and lastly, I would say dealing with all the, the technology thrown at us. So we have multiple technologies on where do we market ourselves on booking platforms? How do we sell ourselves virtual platforms? There's so much out there that we can lose ourselves and we can forget who we authentically are as a tourist guide and forget how we tell our stories. So I would say just take a step back, make sure you research properly, 
you use the platform that's most suitable to you if you choose to go that route um, and don't get swallowed up in that virtual world that's out there. At the end of the day, tourist guides are person-to-person -person people. We want that engagement. We want to see people in person. We want to speak to them in person. So we need to remember that and not forget that. Employment, acknowledgement, and technology. The good list of three. Uh, so for technology, you were talking about different platforms and so on. We have our World Food Travel Marketplace, which is a platform that graduates of our culinary certified tourist guide um, class can actually be, they, as part of their graduation, they get a, a full year on that platform. And what we've discovered on the platform is that consumers, it was originally designed to be more of a B2B thing, but actually more and more consumers are finding it. And it's, they're finding it because of SEO. So even if you're listed on other guide platforms, uh, I think that they should definitely consider our platform because of the SEO benefits. You know, it's all about how many links you've got between different websites. Google knows this, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, that actually leads me to another thing we mustn't forget, and that's your culinary tourist guide certification. So for those 50 somethings that initially said they're not culinary tourist guides, you know, if you're already a qualified tourist guide and you're looking to elevate your offering and you have a passion for food, for food and wine and beverage, I found this course really useful and I consider myself an experienced culinary tourist guide. So you're never too old to learn or to experience. So I can really, really recommend that um, your course at WFTA um, be, be con you know, that our tourist guides really look into that. And if they are interested in it, contact your association who is a member of WFTGA or email us on info at WFTGA.org and we can link you up to that course. Mm. Thanks, Alushka. Um, I'm just going to put the URL for the course in our academy. And uh, you can have a, a quick look at that if that's of interest to you, if you think that's something you want to do. And then if you are a member of a WFTGA uh, Tourist Guide Association, contact them for special pricing. If you're not, we do have special protocols in place, but you still um, have to be a licensed guide or the equivalent in the areas where you are. We're, we're we keep very strict um, protocols on this because the licensed guide profession is a, it's a profession and it's something that is, um, needs to be respected and preserved. And there's a big difference between someone who, who is a licensed professional tourist guide and someone who thinks it would be fun to give a tour. And uh, so we try to maintain, and I can say that we, we've, since we introduced the certification uh, almost two years ago, we have certified quite a few guides uh, of, who are, who have been members of partner associations, but we have only certified two people in the whole world who were not members of partner associations. So, so uh, we try to maintain those strict protocols as well. And we're always grateful for that because we really are, our aim and objective is to promote, promote a profession sector and professional tourist guides. And yeah. this really does speak to that. And again, it's a wonderful marketing tool for me to have that lovely little logo and to say, I've done this and um, I'm ready to go to the next level. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's fantastic a wonderful little thing to have. And we've got another comment here. Is there actually a special license for food tourist guiding? Here in Bahrain, we have BTEA, which I'm licensed in, but not special food tourist guide. So would you like to... That's a difficult one to answer because it really does depend on country to country. In countries where we are regulated and legislated, for example, South Africa, if you are a specialist in certain fields, a nature guide, a culture guide, a wine guide, you have to show the, the certifications that you've studied for it, that it's an additional modules that you've done, that you have that experience, and then you will get that on your card. So it really does uh, depend on what country you're in and how your tourist guiding uh, sector is regulated and legislated. Mm. And as a nonprofit organization, we're authorized to actually certify people who we train in, in our education and certification program. So if you do have the certification through us, you get a certificate that says you've completed X number of hours, you get the, the diploma, you get the pin and you get the marketing visibility. So, so I don't, it can't get much more professional than that, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, 
All right, one more one more question here, and then I think we'll we'll call it. Oh, two more questions. Okay, um, okay. Here we have only the general license. Please, can you provide link for that for me to upgrade? Okay, so Kai, if you go ahead and look in the chat window, I've um, put the link for the uh, culinary tourist guide certification in there. And that'll take you straight to the place on our website. And then if you need additional help, you can either email us at help at worldfoodtravel.org or Alushka also put her email in here, info at wftga.org for more information. Okay, and then uh, last question. If I did a local ministry of tourism that conducted a culinary tours course and licensed, how do I get a license from you? Okay, so Yoni, I think you're talking about our certification program. Our certification is, is different. It's something that we put together ourselves and we, our certification is recognized around the world. If your Ministry of Tourism has offered its own culinary tourist guide training, that is great, but you really need ours in addition to the one from your country. So in your country, your Culinary Tourist Guide training is recognized, but it may not be recognized elsewhere in the world. And so when people are elsewhere in the world, they want to know that you have this designation. So, so you really would need to get ours as well as the one. But I think that you could look at this as an opportunity because the training you've already done is going to make you that much more qualified. And that's something that you could also put on your profile on the marketplace. So good question. Um, could you just put the links again in the chat because you weren't there in the beginning? Yes, we will do that. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and put those links in. And Alushka, would you like to go ahead and, and put your information again? I think you put your email. I don't know if that's uh, the only way you want people to contact you or if you have any other um, contact think, measures. This would be best, this is our everyday email. Um, so it's what that's best just to go through this email. Okay, super. And that's the info at wftga.org for more information. Okay, super. Well, uh, Lushka, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Eric. It's always fun uh, working with you and um, your sessions are always so informative as well from our side. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. I learned some things, uh, including about how to, how to correctly use the microphone now with all the different changes. So not that I'll be out there guiding, but good to know. So when I see it, I can know what's going on. If I ever come to Spain, I will, I will show you. <laughs> I'll <Lovely. do> demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> and just like on the airplanes, right? <laughs> you could do a safety video, Alushka. Yeah, How about that? There we go. There we yeah. go. I just need a little necktie. There you and then go. I'm good to go. Well, it was, it was really a lot of fun. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge with our industry. I could tell by the conversations going on in the chat that people really appreciated your insight. Um, everyone's stressed, everyone's concerned, but you've helped to give us just a, you know, take things down a, a level and help us relax a little bit. You know, times are, are changing, times are going to improve. We're all going to start traveling again. And, and now you've given us some more hope to look forward to. So thank you very much, Alushka. It's a pleasure, Erica, and to everyone who was in the session. It was lovely seeing such global representation. Great. All right. Well, next month, our Food Travel Talk TV will be taking place in the right in the middle of June. It's going to be either the June 15th or 16th, and we will be making the announcement of the speakers and topics very shortly. So save the date on your calendar, and we'll see you next month. Thanks again, Alushka.